The Atomic Gambit podcast is produced by the JFK Library Foundation and made possible with the help of a generous grant from the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation. Also, in the interest of clarity, we have enhanced the quality of some of the archival audio, including secretly recorded meetings from the White House that you'll hear in this episode. Some of the audio may still be difficult to hear. We have full transcripts of each episode available on our website, jfklibrary.org forward slash Atomic Gambit. I remember leaving the White House at the end of that Saturday. It was a uh, beautiful football day. Yeah, thinking that might well be the last sunset I saw. October 27, 1962, was a Saturday and the 12th day of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The night before, President Kennedy and his advisors in XCOM had received what seemed to be a promising message from Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, but their plans to respond would be stopped before they could begin. But then he suddenly issued a new letter on the Saturday, which utterly confused the White House, saying, oh, by the way, the American missiles in Turkey are going to have to go too. The White House couldn't understand what had happened for Khrushchev to send this new message. Maybe a sort of a coup took place in Kremlin, maybe there is somebody else who is in charge now, or maybe there is enormous pressure coming on Khrushchev from so-called hardliners in the presidium. And while Kennedy and his advisors would debate what to do, they would also learn that the crisis had taken a deadly turn. And of course, at that moment, somebody at the White House table says, well, they fired the first shot. And everybody at that moment around that table believed that meant there were going to be more shots. Both Kennedy and Khrushchev would be urged to use deadly force to resolve the crisis. But it was very clear that the hawks were rising. They were gaining, they were finding their voices again. We told you the quarantine wouldn't work. We told you you'd have to bomb and invade. Castro was pushing Khrushchev to basically let's nuke the hell out of America because otherwise they're going to nuke us. This is Atomic Gambit, the Cuban Missile Crisis 60 years later. Episode 4, Black Saturday. At 10 a.m. on Saturday, October 27th, 1962, President Kennedy and his advisors met to review the latest intelligence in Cuba. They were also going to discuss Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev's long message from last night, his Not of War letter, where he indicated that the crisis could be resolved if the U.S. guaranteed to not invade Cuba and lift the quarantine blocking Soviet ships. But before they could start that conversation, JFK was handed a new message from advisor and speechwriter Ted Sorensen. It was a news report that had just come in saying that Khrushchev would remove missiles from Cuba if the United States withdrew its missiles from Turkey. He read the message to the group. Premier Khrushchev told President Kennedy yesterday to withdraw offensive weapons from Cuba if the United States withdrew its rockets from Turkey. I thought he was read by both the association for the Reuters and the same thing. He did. He didn't really say that, did he? Members of XCOM were confused. That was different from the letter they received last night. This new message added a condition that wasn't in Khrushchev's letter from the day before. Sir Max Hastings, author of the 2022 book The Abyss, The Cuban Missile Crisis 1962, explains how Khrushchev's latest message puzzled XCOM. But then he suddenly issued a new letter on the Saturday, which utterly confused the White House, uh, saying, oh, by the way, um, Um, the American missiles in Turkey are going to have to go too. And um, the Americans couldn't understand this. When Khrushchev wrote to Kennedy the night before, he was expecting Kennedy to launch an invasion of Cuba very soon and had hoped to stop that from happening. Serhii Ploki, author of Nuclear Folly, A History of the Cuban Missile Crisis, says when Khrushchev woke up on Saturday and the U.S. had not fired the first shot, he decided to push Kennedy a little further. Then he wakes up the next morning in Moscow to the news that the invasion didn't take place. He thinks, okay, the Americans blinked. So maybe there is, there is a chance for me to get something more and, and raise the price for my withdrawal from Cuba. 
Ploki also explains how Khrushchev took XCOM by surprise by releasing this new message just hours after JFK and his advisors had received his Friday message. It it took uh, really up to 24 hours for a diplomatic letter to be uh, translated, then uh, put in in, in code and then deciphered and and delivered to the White House. His second letter he sends as uh, one that was read in Russian on Radio Moscow. International Service of Radio Moscow, so to speed up uh, the, 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 the process of delivering that message to Washington, to the White House, where he starts talking about the additional condition for his withdrawal of his missiles. Now XCOM had two letters to think about, one that had been transmitted privately to President Kennedy a little over 12 hours before, and this new message broadcast publicly on Saturday morning Eastern Time also in the White House that they don't know which of these letters that they, they should respond to, deal with, whether both of those letters come from, Ke- from Khrushchev, maybe a sort of a coup took place in Kremlin, maybe there is somebody else who is in charge now, or maybe there is enormous pressure coming on Khrushchev from so-called hardliners in the presidium. For the White House, trying to figure out what Khrushchev was doing or even how decisions were made in the Kremlin was difficult because of the nature of the Soviet system. Tom Nichols, professor at the Naval War College and columnist, describes how hard it was at the height of the Cold War to understand the internal workings of the Soviet Union. We didn't know anything about the Soviet Union. I think for younger people, it's... um, I always try to get them to understand that with you know before satellites and before cable and before smartphones, uh, we knew more about the dark side of the moon than we did about certain parts of the Soviet Union because they were just impenet- impenetrable to us. The Kremlin was, you know, political scientists like to talk about the black box of policymaking. The Kremlin was a locked black box lined with lead and you know buried in in snow. JFK and XCOM could only speculate on what prompted the second letter with its stronger terms. McGeorge Bundy, National Security Advisor, explained what he and other advisors thought that motivation was. We reached an informal consensus that, uh, that I don't know whether Tommy agreed that this last night's message was Khrushchev, and this one is his own hard nosed people overruling his public mind. They, they didn't like what he said to you last night. They thought it was the so called hard nosed people who had taken control. But scholars have since learned that that was not the case, according to Max Hastings. There was absolute chaos in the the Kremlin. All that these different letters, these different messages reflected was was the fact that Khrushchev kept rewriting his own script. And the United States, the U.S. government could not get its mind around the the level of chaos that was then prevailing in, in, in the Kremlin. This lack of understanding, as well as Khrushchev's own bombastic personality, led XCOM to believe that Khrushchev could bring the world to the brink of nuclear war. And it's hard to overstate the extraordinary um, lack of understanding on both sides that um, on that Saturday, Khrushchev had four or five days earlier um, admitted to his colleagues in the Presidium around the table in the Kremlin that almost certainly the missiles were going to have to be removed from Cuba and that there was going to have to be a retreat. But because he'd refused to say so and had gone on bluffing and blustering, that nobody in the White House understood this or knew this, and nobody in the world understood it. And as Nina Khrushcheva, granddaughter of Nikita Khrushchev and professor of international affairs at the New School, says, starting a war was on the mind of the Americans, not the Soviets. But once again, going to war is your rhetoric. It's not the Russian rhetoric. Nobody was going to war including, by the way, Khrushchev was very clear, we are not going to war. But in the White House, no one trusted that Khrushchev didn't want to go to war, or that he even was prepared to work with Kennedy. And so for another five days, six days, after uh, Kennedy's broadcast, not only the world, but also the White House, was still in this state of acute tension. They did not know that Khrushchev um, expected to have to back off. They did not know that uh, Khrushchev privately recognized that he lost his gamble. And Khrushchev went on publicly blustering, and he played his hand worse um, after Kennedy's broadcast than he did before. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara expressed his frustration at Khrushchev's second letter and the demand for the U.S. to remove its Jupiter missiles from Turkey. 
Khrushchev had sent two letters in as many days, opening negotiations to end the crisis, but each letter had different terms. In his first private message, he implied construction would stop in Cuba if the U.S. pledged not to invade the island and if they lifted the quarantine. But in this new public message, he agreed to remove, quote, the arms which you described as offensive, end quote, if the U.S. pledged not to invade the island and if the U.S. removed its missiles on the Soviet border in Turkey. All of JFK's advisors in XCOM wanted to ignore this latest message and only focus on Friday's letter. Noting that this new message was sent publicly, the president disagreed and said this was Khrushchev's current offer. I don't see why we picked that track when he's offered us the other track. That offers a little more. We have to assume that this is their new and latest position and it's a public one. The demand to remove the missiles in Turkey came as a surprise, but this was not the first time those missiles had been topic of conversation amongst JFK and his advisors during the crisis. On the 22nd, President Kennedy had asked his advisors to look into the possibility of removing the missiles. Even before the crisis had begun, those missiles in Turkey on the Soviet border were out of date and vulnerable to attack from the Soviet Union. National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy argued that agreeing to Khrushchev's proposal would be damaging to the partnership the U.S. had with Turkey and other NATO countries. I think if we sound as if we wanted to make this trade to our NATO people, Forty years after the crisis, Secretary McNamara reflected. We considered Khrushchev's offer, as uh, Ted said, to take the missiles out of Cuba if we'd remove the U.S. Jupiters from, from Turkey. But both Turkey and NATO strongly opposed that action. XCOM was also opposed to removing the missiles in Turkey. In meetings, advisors suggested framing the missiles in Cuba and the missiles in Turkey as two very different situations. The missiles in each country served different purposes. They argued that the United States had installed the Jupiter missiles in Turkey openly, in contrast to the secrecy that surrounded the Soviets' installations in Cuba. The United States would not bring the Jupiter missiles into the discussion about Cuba. McGeorge Bundy pointed out that it was important to stress that the danger was with the Cuban missiles only. Despite that argument, JFK didn't want to ignore the missiles in Turkey. Max Hastings says that unlike the rest of his advisors, Kennedy saw that he could work with what Khrushchev wanted the Americans to do. And he, from a very early stage, uh, saw not only the, the possibility of simply giving a promise that the United States would not attack Cuba, but secondly also removing the uh, Jupiter missiles uh, from Turkey. And he saw that there would have to be a deal if you wanted this peacefully. Throughout the long and tense meetings on the 27th, JFK emphasized that most people would see the removal of the missiles in Turkey as reasonable. But as Michael Dobbs, author of One Minute to Midnight, Kennedy, Khrushchev, and Castro on the Brink of War explains, this was not an opinion held by anyone else in the room. And at one point, um, the president was you know, in the minority of one in the XCOM in believing that these missiles that we had in Turkey, land-based um, missiles targeted on the southern part of the Soviet Union, were pretty useless strategically, and we would be losing very little by giving them up, part possibly from a loss of face. And the president was not prepared to risk a nuclear war over what he considered to be a few obsolete missiles in Turkey that could easily be replaced by you know, missiles deployed on a nuclear submarine, for example, in the eastern Mediterranean. But in all the discussion around the Jupiter missiles and options for military action, there was one thing that was not up for debate. Kennedy had been receiving daily intelligence updates from the CIA about progress on the missile sites in Cuba. The president had one primary objective before negotiating anything else, stopping missile construction in Cuba. I think what we've got to do is say that we've got to make the key of this letter the cessation of work. That we're all in agreement on. There's no question about that. As the White House looked to stop that construction, the president and his advisors would face some of the most serious conflicts in the crisis yet. After a short break, we look at how situations develop beyond the president's control that could have led the U.S. and Soviet Union over the brink and into all-out war. 
There is so much we can learn about today by going back and digging into the stories of our presidents. My name's Lillian Cunningham. I'm a reporter and host at The Washington Post. And that idea is what inspired my podcast, Presidential. It's a journey through the lives of every single American president. From President Kennedy to lesser-known early presidents like Millard Fillmore, each reveals a lesson about our country's history. Listen to Presidential and other Washington Post shows wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. As the director of the library, I get to oversee the work of our dedicated archivists, museum staff, and educators as they work every day to share the information they find in the library with the public. Are you listening to our podcast wondering if there's more to the story? Well, you can find out yourself how deep the story goes by exploring our resources here at the John F. Kennedy Library. If you want to learn more about what you've heard today, we have links to the JFK Library's archives, including photos, films, and primary source documents. We also have oral history interviews from some of the key members of the team advising President Kennedy during and after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Visit jfklibrary.org forward slash atomic gambit to get started. Outside of the White House, the crisis was heating up. U-2 planes, used for intelligence gathering, had been continually flying over Cuba to keep up to date on the progress being made on construction related to the Soviet missiles. Fidel Castro, angered by the frequent overflights, gave orders to shoot at the spy planes. Um, Meanwhile, um, over Cuba, first of all, the Cubans start shooting wildly at low-level U.S. Navy reconnaissance aircraft over Cuba. This is the first time they've started shooting, and they don't do, don't do any harm. But nonetheless, um, the word comes back to the White House that the Cubans have started shooting. Suddenly, in the afternoon meeting of XCOM on October 27th, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara received word that one of the planes had been shot down. At first, it wasn't clear if the pilot had survived. Later, reports confirmed that Major Rudolf Anderson had been killed in the crash. But it wasn't the Cubans who had shot him down. And finally, of course, that afternoon, um, and again, hours after the event, at the White House, they're suddenly told that a Soviet anti-aircraft missile had shot down a U-2 over Cuba, killing the pilot. 35-year-old Anderson had flown his first flight over Cuba on October 15th, where he discovered some of the missile sites. This mission on the 27th was his sixth over the island. Deputy Secretary of Defense Roswell Gilpatrick later recalled the shock of that news. In the case of, of uh, the shooting down of, by the SAM in Cuba of, of Major Anderson, it was just the human element. Uh, here was a man who, this is the first casualty of this, in terms of human lives of this crisis. And, uh, That was an emotional, sentimental thing. President Kennedy posthumously awarded Anderson the first Air Force Cross, as well as the Distinguished Service Medal, the Purple Heart, and the Cheney Award. He also wrote to Anderson's widow, Jane, who was pregnant with their third child. He expressed the importance and urgency of Anderson's mission and included a handwritten postscript that read, quote, Your husband's mission was of the greatest importance, but I know how deeply you must feel his loss, end quote. With the first combat casualty, the crisis took on a new, more dangerous dimension. And, of course, at that moment, somebody at the White House table says, well, they fired the first shot. And everybody at that moment around that table believed that that meant there were going to be more shots. The death of the pilot increased pressure on Kennedy to react with force. Advisors suggested a targeted strike on the specific surface-to-air missile, or SAM site, that shot Anderson down. The pressure especially after the shooting down of the U-2 and the killing of the pilots. Political pressure within the United States for um, military action was building all the time. And I don't think one could have counted on uh, the president not ordering bombing on the Monday or Tuesday of that following week. While JFK's military advisors discussed not if, but when to attack the SAM sites, the president's concern was whether or not to keep putting American pilots at risk by continuing overflights of Cuba. 
On the 40th anniversary of the crisis, Advisor Ted Sorensen recalled the caution President Kennedy showed in the face of increased demands of reacting with force. When the U-2 was shot down and the chiefs pressed to retaliate immediately, Kennedy said, not so fast. Yes, we agreed that we would take out any SAM site that shot down our U-2, but not so fast. Let's wait and make certain who authorized that uh, shot. Let's see what happens with the correspondence negotiations that we're now engaged in uh, with Khrushchev. As pressure rose in the White House to retaliate, two more incidents beyond Kennedy's or Khrushchev's control pushed the world closer to the brink. That same day in Alaska, a U-2 pilot named Charles Maltzby took off on a standard reconnaissance mission that turned dangerous. It was a perfectly routine intelligence gathering mission um, designed to see whether the Soviets were testing nuclear bombs in the atmosphere and the pilot was meant to fly to the North Pole and come back. There's a navigational error that causes him to blunder over the Soviet Union on the most dangerous day of the, of the missile crisis, the most dangerous day of the Cold War. And the Russians sent up MiG fighters to try to shoot him down. The Americans responded by you know, sending up planes to, turned out planes armed with nuclear missiles to escort him back to Alaska. The president learned of the mission only after it happened. And um, when Kennedy heard about this, uh, he was, of course, appalled because he realized that the Russians could have interpreted this as um, being a reconnaissance flight ahead of a bomber attack. And of course, when everything, everything is on a hair trigger, to have allowed a U-2 flight to take place out of Alaska was absolutely crazy. Tom Nichols explains how this accidental diversion into enemy airspace might not have been as consequential if it had happened at any other time. So, you know, um, a, a border guard shooting across a border during a crisis, something that might not have been a big deal in peacetime or might have gotten written off as an accident during a crisis could be interpreted as a signal or as the first shot of an attack. This is one of the reasons that the Kennedy administration was so frustrated with trying to get control about who's flying B-52s and U-2s and where are they going? And because every single thing needed to be tightly controlled because you didn't want your opponent to take something as indicative uh, of, as a, of an act of war. And yet a third incident, not known about until 40 years after it happened, threatened to unleash war. And um, at sea, there's some very tense exchanges between U.S. warships and Soviet submarines. There are four Soviet Foxtrot submarines, uh, all armed with nuclear torpedoes, off uh, in, the, in the eastern Atlantic. U.S. Navy ships had found the four Soviet submarines they had been searching for. The ships used practice depth chargers, small explosives as a signal for the submarines to rise to the surface. The submarine captains had been informed of this method, but they had a hard time distinguishing real depth charges from practice ones. In an interview 24 years after the crisis, Chief of Naval Operations George Anderson was asked how he thought the crews of the Soviet submarines reacted to the U.S. ships hounding them. I imagine they expected it just as we would expect their reaction. Now, if they'd all been nuclear subs, or a large percentage of them had been nuclear subs, it would have been more complicated. What Anderson didn't know, and no American knew until 2002, was that the submarines did have nuclear torpedoes on board. Inside the submarines, temperatures soared to 130 degrees Fahrenheit, with conditions becoming more and more unbearable for their crews, especially as the depth charges exploded around them. One of the commanders described the atmosphere inside the subs as, quote, it was as if you were sitting in an iron barrel that was being beaten with a sledgehammer, end quote. Underwater and isolated from the rest of the world, and under increasing stress, one Soviet captain considered fighting back with all he had. So you have the, the episode involving a Soviet submarine with a nuclear torpedo being harassed by U.S. warships, 
and the captain starts thinking that war may have broken out on the surface and he starts thinking about using the nuclear torpedo. When the submarine surfaced, American planes dropped flares meant to help with their surveillance photos. The Soviets thought they were being attacked and went below in order to launch the nuclear torpedo. A crew member of the American ship apologized for the plane and a truce was made before any weapons could be fired. And there were moments during the quarantine where if we had destroyed a submarine or if one of their submarines had used a nuclear torpedo, as we now know they were considering doing at the time, events would have spiraled out of control of the decision makers because they're not there on the front line. They're not there in the, in the area of conflict and they can't control every single thing that every single person is doing. And that's what, what makes a crisis so unpredictable is these contingent events that can totally derail everything that's happening. Up next, as tensions increased with both countries narrowly avoiding events that could lead to war, Kennedy faced his own trusted advisors who continued to press for military action. How would JFK respond? Find out coming up after the break. Hello, my name is Rachel Floor, and I'm the executive director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. Are you enjoying Atomic Gambit? This podcast is just one of many initiatives, programs, and resources supported by our foundation. The JFK Library Foundation is a nonprofit that provides financial support, staffing, and creative resources for the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. Learn more about the JFK Library and Foundation at jfklibrary.org. And if you want to join other supporters just like you, you can donate at jfklibrary.org forward slash donate. Earlier in 1962, a book was published that caught President Kennedy's eye. The book, The Guns of August by Barbara Tuckman, recounted the early stages and strategies of World War I. JFK gave copies of the books to friends and colleagues, and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara remembered that he instructed his advisors in the Cuban crisis to take note of its lessons. He had asked each member of the Security Council to read the first chapter of Barbara Tuckman's book, uh, Guns of August, which uh, describes the way the powers bungled in to uh, the First World War without any intention of uh, starting a First World War. And he, in a sense, he said, read that, recognize that it was a tragedy to bungle into the First World War that way. It'll be the end of civilization if we bungle into a nuclear war that way. Michael Dobbs says that JFK found lessons to be learned from the guns of August in the nuclear age. And Kennedy was determined that the same thing would not happen with a, a nuclear war. And I think, you know, the lessons of the, you know, he had studied the origins of the First World War. And when he was there in the XCOM, meeting in particularly on Black Saturday, when it seemed that everything was spiraling out of control, he, the president, was determined you know, to do everything in his power to prevent a nuclear war. JFK and his advisors used all available intelligence at the time in their meetings. But for all the intel provided by the surveillance photos of Cuba, he and his advisors didn't actually know about all of the weapons that were on the island. Americans wouldn't know this until 30 years after the crisis was over. And one's blood does run cold uh, when you see uh, that the intelligence machine didn't know that uh, those Russians had tactical nuclear weapons as well as strategic nuclear weapons. They didn't know anything like the strength of the Russian forces in Cuba. The U.S. knew about the city destroying strategic weapons that could reach as far as New York City and Los Angeles. But they didn't know about the tactical weapons, smaller bombs meant for use at closer range, like on a battlefield. Because they didn't have all the facts on the ground about the military capabilities in Cuba, an aggressive action against the island would have been much deadlier than they thought at the time. The U.S. air surveillance, human intelligence was never, never was able to uncover the presence of the tactical nuclear weapons on the island. It was also a major, major failure of the U.S. intelligence because the estimates on the basis of which the decisions were being made in terms of the invade Cuba, not invade Cuba. 
Without all that information, XCOM continued to discuss when and how they could invade Cuba as events outside the White House unfolded. But the pressure, especially after the shooting down of the U-2 and the killing of the pilots, the political pressure within the United States for uh, military action was building all the time. And I don't think one could have counted on uh, the president not ordering bombing on the Monday or Tuesday of that following week. Since the president addressed the nation five days earlier, combat troops had been mobilizing to invade or launch an airstrike against Cuba. In XCOM meetings, advisors laid out their options for use of deadly force. So the military plan now is, is basically invasion because we've set a large strike to leave the invasion. We might try a large strike without starting the invasion uh, or without having the money to sight on the invasion at the time of the strike because we can't carry it out anyhow for a period of X days. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, in a separate meeting, worked out their own recommended course of action for the president. But as Robert McNamara later described, JFK was unconvinced. At about 4 o'clock Saturday afternoon, October 27, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Taylor, stated to President Kennedy, the chiefs unanimously recommended an attack within about 30 hours, that is to say, Monday morning. And the majority of the president's civilian advisors shared that view. But the president said, in effect, I'm not going to take this nation to war over a pile of junk. It was acknowledged by all of us that the Jupiter missiles uh, were obsolete, likely to be ineffective. President Kennedy repeatedly emphasized the optics of the U.S. going to war over Cuba when there was an option to de-escalate the crisis in the form of the Jupiter missiles in Turkey. Frederick Logeval, Pulitzer Prize-winning historian and JFK biographer, explains what the president meant when he said, I don't see how we'll have a very good war. What Kennedy is saying is that, you know, if, it, if the world learns that we could have had a deal, that we chose not to take that deal, and, and we instead opt for a war, opt for a, a military option, then uh, it's not going to be a very good war. It's not going to look very good for us because what we've turned down is a pretty good deal. Uh, it's a way to preserve the peace, to keep tens of millions of people of dying, and we somehow chose to reject that option. Despite the opposition he faced from everyone in XCOM, from his Secretary of Defense to his own brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, JFK was set on resolving the crisis diplomatically. I think Kennedy is somewhat unique in his insistence here in the face of deep and broad opposition within the XCOM, within his top advisory group, his insistence on finding a negotiated solution to this. It's quite extraordinary, given, given again, how much I believe they were pushing the other way. Roughly 10 hours after receiving Khrushchev's message during the morning meeting, XCOM finished its response in the evening. It had taken hours of meetings discussing how to respond. Different drafts circulated around the room before a satisfactory response had been written. Ted Sorensen, special counsel to the president, recalled the process of finalizing Kennedy's response. First, there was the letter that was sent to Khrushchev. And after a good deal of wrangling in the XCOM about what should be in that letter, the president asked Robert Kennedy and me to draft it. And that letter took the best elements out of Khrushchev's letter and transformed it into a satisfactory uh, compromise. The letter stated that work on the missile sites must stop in Cuba and the weapons must be removed in order for the U.S. to remove the quarantine and pledge not to invade Cuba. It did not mention the American missiles in Turkey. At 8 p.m., JFK's message to Khrushchev was transmitted and released to the press. A select group of President Kennedy's advisors met in the Oval Office. It had been decided that Robert Kennedy would again meet with the Soviet ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin. The attorney general would give him JFK's letter to Khrushchev, along with another private message. And it was through Anatoly Dobrynin that John Kennedy uses Robert Kennedy to send this, this message to Kremlin, saying that, well, we are prepared to remove the missiles from Turkey, the only condition is that we can't 
publicly go with that and announce that it should be a separate arrangement outside of the of the agreement reached on Cuba and it has to be secret if the information leaks the deal is off Tom Nichols explains the usefulness of having this back channel in times of crises and negotiations I think back channels are among the most important tools in diplomacy you need to have a place to go where you can talk to your opponents out of the glare of public lights you need to have a place where you can float ideas have arguments put forward proposals that may get shot down without having to do everything in front of the cameras as robert kennedy met with dobernin excom had one final meeting at the end of the day ted sorensen later described after the uh final letter was sent off uh, with Robert Kennedy to deliver to uh, Ambassador uh, Dobrynin. There was a brief reconvening of the XCOM in the cabinet room. Bobby was not there because he was still with Dobrynin. The president was not there at the beginning. Sorensen recounted that even with Kennedy's message with its agreement on its way to Khrushchev, the matter of using military force had not been put to bed for some. But it was very clear that the hawks were rising. They were gaining, they were finding their voices again. We told you the quarantine wouldn't work. We told you you'd have to bomb and invade. And there was a debate. Some members were still protesting against that and the consequences. Saturday, October 27th, would come to be called Black Saturday because of the dangerous near misses that happened throughout the day. Max Hastings explains what JFK's advisors' outlooks were as they headed into Sunday. So it was a terrifying day. And by the time they all went to bed that night, in the minds of JFK and many of those uh, of, of, at his top table, there was a real fear that the country was going to war. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara later remembered the atmosphere that evening. I remember leaving the White House at the end of that Saturday. It was a uh, beautiful football day. Yeah, thank you. That might well be the last sunset I saw. What the Americans also didn't know was that in Cuba, Fidel Castro had written to Nikita Khrushchev with an urgent request. Nina Khrushcheva describes the contents of that message. Castro was pushing Khrushchev to basically let's nuke the hell out of America because otherwise they're going to nuke us. And uh, uh, so Khrushchev knew that all this statements or all these feelings really should not really take the better of anybody. I mean, he himself was impulsive, but he also knew where to stop. Castro had been expecting a U.S. invasion of Cuba, and according to historian Serhii Ploki, his plea upset Khrushchev. Castro, who got information and intelligence information that turned out to be false, he expects the attack on Cuba happening within anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. And he puts together a letter that he, he writes and then edits together with the Soviet ambassador to Havana. The letter asks Khrushchev to consider a first strike, nuclear strike against the United States of America, which makes Khrushchev furious and uh, um, makes him even more frightened than he was before. The knot of war that Khrushchev had written about just the day before was tightening, and neither he nor Kennedy knew if it would be possible to stop it before it was too late. Find out more on our next episode of Atomic Gambit. Thank you for listening to this episode of Atomic Gambit. Along with Jamie Richardson and myself, Atomic Gambit is made possible with help from our co-producer Rick King and supervising producer Valerie Linson. Thank you to our research assistants Sarah LaRussi and Megan McKee, and our independent fact-checker Ben Schaefer. Thank you to the library's archive staff for assistance with researching and digitizing additional material. We also want to thank the Miller Center at the University of Virginia for providing the recordings of the White House tapes used in this program. A special thank you to Ambassador Caroline Kennedy for permission to use audio from Jacqueline Kennedy's 1964 oral history interview. Our music is composed by Premium Beat and podcast artwork provided by Brian Kang. We also thank all of our guests for lending their voices and expertise to this podcast.